Hey, everybody. Welcome to Duner's World. I'm your host, Mike Duner Muldoon, broadcasting from Mayapak, New York. Very excited to welcome Albert Bouchard from Blue Oyster Cult on my show today. Oh, my God. Can't wait to talk about him. Such great history. He's got a new album out, awesome vinyl releases on card vinyl. Uh, can't wait to talk about Albert. He's Blue Coop, amazing group he's been in with Dennis Dunaway from Alice Cooper Band. Uh, so much cool stuff to talk about. Thanks to Richard Black for coming on yesterday, talking about um, his new uh, single, Someday. Amazing song. Everyone should go check it out. Uh, so we're coming down to the end of season one for Duner's World. I have two more episodes left, and it's um, I got uh, Jez Graham coming on, and I got Ralph, uh, Roger Caps and Ralph Hewitt coming on for the uh, U.S. Festival special, and then I'm going to call it quits. And then season two is coming up, and big things are coming. So stay tuned for that. But for today, let's get Albert Bouchard in here. Albert, my brother. Hey. How you doing, man? Good. Great. Good job here. I can't see. Oh, there you go. Hey, welcome to Duner's World. Yeah. Thanks for coming out, man. Duner's World music. I thought it was going to be like world music, you know? Dude, I'm everything. I'm David Byrne, world music. I, I love everything. I'm Zappa to Weird Al to Slayer to Blue Eyes to Cult. <laughs> cool. I do it all, my man. And we're both uh, we're both New York uh, residents, right? You, you, it's funny, people. I'm in Mayapack, New York, which is an hour north of Manhattan. I'm upstate New York, but you right. were born and raised in upstate New York. Yes, yes, like, You're real you upstate, upstate New York. Me, yeah. <laughs> as upstate as it gets, right? Like, was it Clayton? Yeah, Clayton, New York, right down the St. Lawrence. You know, Canada is right there. You can almost throw a stone. It's well, St. Lawrence is about ten miles wide there. So, so you did high school and like, like grade school and high school there. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, uh, in my early life, I traveled around. My dad had a job with uh, Voice of America, so we we oh. actually lived in Thessalonica, Greece, for uh, for a year. Wow. What an experience that must have been. Yeah, it was it was weird, but it was cool. You know, I mean, it. Uh, I'd never seen uh, people so poor. Really? Yeah, yeah. It was it was uh, 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 fla- it flabbergasted me because, you know, we were poor. We lived with my grandmother, you know, for, you know, before that. And then my dad got this great job and we moved to Greece and all of a sudden we had servants and you know a brand new chevrolet you know you know probably the only car my dad ever had in his entire life i only knew car you know but i mean he had lots of cars but so uh and then we lived in rochester for a year and then we moved back to clayton and uh of course wow. clayton seemed like paradise you know it didn't seem like anything you know and what was I- the scene like what was the scene like growing up in clayton like in in was it rockers? Was there like what was? No, was no, like, no. It was well. Dylan, back it was then. Dylan and Dylan Hendrix getting to you? No, uh, Hendrix wasn't there yet. When <laughs> when when I was born in 1947, so there wasn't really much rock music to speak of. It pre- probably didn't exist then. Uh, by the time uh, I came back to Clayton, it was uh, 1953, I guess. So rock music was just starting to happen you know the electric guitar you know uh fender and gibson were fully oh, this around. was bubbling at the surface yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you had rock around the clock with you know bill uh, haley sure, bill sure. Haley and all of yeah. that stuff but, and i didn't really like it that much actually you know Interesting. Huh? you know but i was more into classical music and jazz i love jazz too my dad was a big jazzer and my mom had an extensive record collection of uh Benny Goodman and Bing Crosby. That was her thing. Great stuff. Yeah. I so I recently started recollecting vinyl during the pandemic. So yeah. I, and, and I bought a lot of collections. So I get all these, you know, a lot of, you know, records you don't want and whatnot. But some of them, I have the turntable, I throw them on, and that stuff's so good, man. It's like yeah. that old, oh, I, I'm really enjoying that. It's, it's, well, my mother's uh, records were all 78s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another time. Another time. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. She didn't have any Robert Johnson, did she? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. She wasn't into the blues at all. No, my no. dad, my, she was very, you know, she was Irish, you know, first generation Irish. And sure. uh, so her taste was not, you know, it was very uh, 
provincial kind of, you know, whereas my dad, he loved everything. He, he was really into jazz and he loved and Nancy Wilson was his favorite singer and he loved my Mahalia Jackson. So he liked all the black stuff, you know, and my mom didn't like it. She's like, why are you listening to that darky music? Well, that's that's the that's the soul infiltrating upstate New York, right? That's a it's it's yeah. back then. I mean, there was a lot in between. Yeah. There's a lot in between where you were in New York City, where all that was coming, yeah. right? Like, I mean, uh, when I was uh, living in Rochester, I had a best friend who was black. But when we went back to Clayton, no black people whatsoever yeah. at all. Yeah. Now it's different, you know. Uh, it's gotten a lot, you know. Cat, Camp Drum you know, expanded and, and it's like um, a big military base now. And uh, so there's a lot of people that come there and they, they like it and they, they stay, you know, I mean, there's maybe some prejudice up there, but very little really. Good. That's good to hear. People Progress are is good. Happy, happy to see <laughs> other people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when you're in high school, what are you listening to? So, so when you started playing and, and, what what are the first like influence Beatles? Beatles were everywhere. Uh, actually, no. I mean, no? even Beatles. I didn't really like the Beatles at first <laughs> because we were a Beach Boys cover band. Oh, there you okay. So okay. I was like, oh, these guys can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Get right, right, oh, all the time. <laughs> you know, but then you know, then I heard uh, Paul McCartney imitating Little Richard, and I was like. Oh yeah, no, he's pretty good. Yeah, he's got it. He's kind of got it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what's the first band you played out in? Well, I had a little band with my. Uh, I mean, yeah, I played in the school band. You know, I took piano lessons. I did recitals, but that yeah. was all a solo gig, right and, right? and you know, when I was like eleven, you know. But then, uh, um, then when I was 12, I started a band with my cousin, Teddy, who was uh, 11, and my brother, Joe, who was 10. Wow. So, yeah. Some young so. lads banging the instruments. Yeah, yeah. And we played <laughs> we played like novelty tunes, like, yes, sir, that's my baby. <laughs> you know, we played that. We played uh, The Peppermint Twist by Joey D. Good song. Great we song. Played Wonderland by Night, which my, my, my brother Joe played the trumpet. You know, it was Sweet. a Bert Kempfer uh, song. It was a big hit in 59 or 58 or something like that when we, we were doing that. And um, and Bert Kempfer was the guy who first recorded the Beatles. Well, he saw them in the Star Club and brought them in the studio and made their fir- very first recordings. Interesting. Very cool. Very cool. Wow record producer by the time the beat you know that was like a long time you know we were we were a band for many years you know playing like ventures and you know and I then love the the ventures love the ventures all the surf music you know so that's awesome man that's so cool yeah. so then when how did you make the trip from upstate new york that's about six hours right from where you were down yeah. to long island yeah right, so how do you get to stony brook so well uh i uh Went to to Clarkson College of Technology, so that's in Potsdam, right? And, right. And uh, there I met uh, Don Roser, and uh, we had a band in college. You know, Don and 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 my friend Jeff and his friend Bruce, and and then this guy who was an amazing singer, uh, Skip, uh, was our uh, singer. And uh, the second year, my sophomore year. Uh, he kept saying, oh, you've got to see the Blues Project. So every time the Blues Project would play in Manhattan, we would, uh, you know, at the Cafe Gogo, we would get, mm. we'd borrow somebody's car and drive down to the city. Sometimes just go to the show and then drive back, you know, we'd yeah. get back up to date at, you know, you know, six in the morning or something. <laughs> it's like a full of all-nighter, you know. So we did that uh probably four or five times. And at the end of that sophomore year, we decided to drop out and become musicians because our band be- had gotten very, very popular by yeah. that time. And we could command a lot of money, you know, uh, uh, even now it would be, a, you know, we were getting $500 a show and there was hey, five. Yeah. Fuck yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> that was in 1966. 
wow, well, so, yeah, was huge, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. but oh, we can we can make a living at this, you know. And so we we uh, well, it was summer, so. But Don and I had decided this is it. Don and I and Jeff, we'd all decided this is it. We're not really, you know, it's too much fun playing music. And all and, in, you're all in. And we're making money. You know, we yeah. had money in the bank. It's like, you know, we were able to buy new new gear and everything, you know. So we really were sounding good and tight. And uh, and then <laughs> then we we tried to get gigs, and they would, would people would want to pay us fifteen dollars. Well, for the whole hey, band. Hey, <laughs> now, oh, well. <laughs> it was it was a rude awakening. It was like, hmm. oh shit. So uh, after about uh, a month, the band broke up. Everybody went home to their parents and whatnot. And my yeah. parents were like, uh, "You are not going to sit around the house, you know, and eat our food and stuff. You've got to get a job." So I got a job. As hey, a that's co- what you'd say, or I would say to my kid now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, no, my kid is. I, I said that a couple of years ago I, to my he, kid. <laughs> you know, you're right. I, I, my kid is. He just moved into in with me last year, right before the pan, pandemic. And but he's, you know, he's got a job, so which well, I got. Mine does too. Mine does work as well. So I say so. <laughs> yeah, so, but it's good. You know, it's you know. I mean, I have enough room, and you know, I'm doing pretty yeah, well. Man. So, uh, uh, yeah. So that was. That uh, then, uh, so I'm working at a car as a carpenter, and I get a call from Jeff, the, you know, the other guy that dropped out, and he's mm-hmm. in a band in Chicago, and they need a drummer. They can't find anybody that's good enough, and Jeff has touted me to this guy, so they fly me and my drums to Chicago, where I play in this band. It was called Bafo, B O F F O. It's I don't know. It's some sort of in joke, I guess. But anyway. Uh, the band broke up after two weeks. Ooh, that's short. Yeah. Well, we had a record deal. <laughs> see, so that was a thing. And uh, the the day that we broke up was the day that the lead singer and songwriter got the advance. Oh, man. Come on now. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> he took a check and bounced. Little bitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never heard, a, a, heard from again. Oh, man. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. So, so then I was stuck in Chicago with no band. I had to get a job, you know. And so your I, drums. <laughs> and my drums. And uh, eventually I, I made my way back to Long Island. Don, Don had sent me a, a, a letter, which, uh, you know, to my mother's house. And she, she forwarded it. By the time I was living at the YMCA and basically being supported by my parents. Yeah. Hey, hey. <laughs> Do what you got to do, man. I did it. We all yeah, did it. All the money that I did for rent, you know, it was but, coming back to me. <laughs> Plus, so, uh, so, uh, sh- so that she sent me uh, uh, the letter, and it, in it, he said, um, I met, you remember that magazine, that terrible magazine, Crawdaddy, that we used to read? And I'm like, and, and, and he said, Don't. She said, I met, he said, I met this guy who writes for that magazine and he said, he's going to make me a star, Sandy Proman. So oh. when he came to Chicago, I said, I want to meet the Sandy Proman, you know, take me back to New York. Maybe he can help, help me, you know, Don, Oh, I said, maybe, you know, Don said, well, I've got a band and we've got a drummer. I'm like, okay, well just bring me back to New York and, and maybe, uh, you know, I can work with the Sandy guy and he can help me with my career, you know. So uh, I came back to New York. I uh, met Sandy and I liked him. He liked me. And for some reason, the drummer that they had had gotten busy. He, he his family was in construction. And so mm-hmm. he was uh, he got they got a big project. You know, I, I mean, I've seen him many times. You know, his name is Joe Dick. Joe Dick. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. What a, yeah I wonder <laughs> if he got teased. You know. Oh, poor guy. You know, oh. That's his real name, Joe I Dick. Do. And <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so uh, he, you know, and he did pretty well for himself, but he's not doing music. He's right. Uh, you know, he. He, Dick it uh, around. <laughs> still, still got that construction business and still doing well. So, uh, 
so they so they needed a drummer so that was that you know and i started playing with them and uh and that's how I got to, to Stony Brook because uh, D- Don lived in St. James, which was just uh, one town over from Stony Brook, you know. Right, right. And then when did you meet Les Bronstein? I met him. He came. Actually, he was discovered by um, uh, Sandy Perlman's girlfriend, Joan Shapiro, who he la- later married. But uh, so and and. So I came to, when I came to New York first for the first two weeks, I lived at the Roser's house, you know, Don Roser, mm-hmm. his, his parents' house, because we were, you know, he was there, too. And then uh, after two weeks, I moved in to this uh, this off campus housing, which had uh, a whole five girls and they had an extra bedroom. It was a huge house. So, so I got to stay with the five girls. and one of them was Sandy's. Uh, yeah, I know. I, you know, I tried. I tried making the moves, but you know, I can make this move. I can make this work. You know, <laughs> this could <can> work. <laughs> yeah, but it didn't happen. It didn't. It never happened. But uh. I, I did meet <laughs> Les there. We all met yeah. Les, and so Les was this guy who, you know, he had his own thing. You know, he'd had a hit record already. You know, and so he had money. He had a publishing deal. He was like, you know, he was pretty, uh, pretty well. Uh, off, but he would he would always come over. Even when we got the band house, he would come over and jam with us, you know. And uh, and we had a lot of different people in in the band in the beginning. I, I'd say about ten, you know. One of them was Jackson Brown, actually. Really? Yeah, Interesting. But, I know I mean, before anybody ever heard of him, you know. Wow. You know, he never made a record or anything. He'd never even been in a band. We were his first band that he ever played with. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the guys in the band at that time, John Wiesenthal, had given Jackson guitar lessons. Really? So John said, I'm I'm in this amazing band. You got to come back, come here and uh, and uh, and jam with us. So Jackson came and then Les came and he Les and, and Jackson used to, you know, jam together a little bit. That's too. F- I wonder if, if that was ever recorded. Les Bronstein with Jackson no, Brown. He, he didn't. <laughs> We did not have a tape recorder at that time, you know. I yeah. think John had one, but he didn't want to bring it to the band house because he thought it'd get ruined or something. Or Right, right. So, Albert, we're in connection. My wife, she roommated with Les's daughter. Oh, wow. Yeah. How's that? I've, I've met Les. I've been to Les's granddaughter's, uh, was it a christening? Not a christening, shower. <laughs> I, I know Les. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. cool. Crazy. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Small world, right? Small world. Yeah. Living. And Ross, the boss, has been on my show. So we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very good. Very good. Yeah. Well, I'm working with Ross right now. Oh, that's Ross is Ross is working with everybody. I know. He, he is super prolific. It's crazy. Makes me feel like a, a dud. <laughs> Let me tell you a, a little funny story. Uh, is that uh, so uh, I've had some, you know, uh, you know, the the situation here is that you can't really go anywhere and do anything, yeah. you know, so you got to stay put. So uh, I have my girlfriend lives on Long Island in Blue Point, which is just the other side of Stony Brook. It's, right. it's odd that uh, she, you know, that I ended up in Blue Point where, you know, the blue, <laughs> where the oysters are, are named for, you know, because <laughs> where they need to come from, from the Great South Bay. So. Uh, so I'm out there and I've got all my tapes. And so I'm like, you know, somebody, one of my, one of the fans that said, you know, what happened to that demo that you did of sinful love with Ross, the boss? I'm always talking about this demo. It was like the demo was so great that it ruined my appreciation of Blue Oyster Cult's version. I thought they ruined the song and I never really liked it. You know, so, and, but I hadn't heard it in many years, you know, like at least maybe 30 years, almost 30 years since I heard that demo. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I pulled it out and I put it on my tape recorder. You know, I sat it, you know, it, it was, um, it was before uh, the Ampex 456 tape came out. Now, that is the tape that was the most popular tape 
for many, many years in the starting in the eighties. And that's the tape where the um, polyurethane uh, kind of, it breaks down and it sticks together. So those right. are the tapes you have to uh, bake. But this one was a Bassif. Bassif is the best tape. It's made in Germany. And uh, you don't have to bake that because it's still pristine. Right. There's no, you know, I played some of those 456 tapes, the Ampex, and, uh, you know, and after you got through the reel, you see like a little pile of br- brown stuff, you know, <laughs> the table, right. you know under, the, under the heads, you know, mm. you know, and then you go to clean the head off and you got to use like five Q-tips. And- <laughs> <laughs> So, and, oh, and the other thing about playing those old tapes is that um, uh, after a while, I started, when I, when we worked at the record plant, and this is, you know, Agents of Fortune era. Right. Uh, and Spectres and some of the others. And so uh, at the record plant, they would always be editing, always editing. And, and that was one of the, the, the revelations is, oh, you don't have to get it all in one take. You can do like a few takes and they'll right. put them all together. Yeah, sure. You know, and sometimes if if it looks like that's the way you have to go, you know, I usually didn't play with a click track, but if we were going to edit, I would play with a click track so is it, you know, they could easily edit the the pieces together. Mm. So when I my home demos, I started editing everything together, you know, playing with the click track, editing. And so Every so over the years, that ed, that glue on the edit tape dries up. So every time you hit it, ha- edit it goes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, oh. and so you know, I, at first, you know, first I was like, okay, I don't know what to do. I'm just gonna, you know, ignore the song. You know, wrap it around and just keep going, and or, or wrap it around and and rewind it and just never touch it. So, but uh, then over the Christmas vacation, I went and uh, and looked at this uh, process and I was like, oh, here's my editing block. I'll just, uh, I'll just, you know, the tape is still sticky, so I'll put some new tape on it. So, so I was working? editing all of my old stuff, but, you know, cool. I mean, making the same edits, not cutting anything, but. Right, but, right. But the. When I listened to this uh, Sinful Love demo, I'm like, yeah, it, my feeling is still the same. It beats the crap out of, uh, you know, the BOC's version. Right, right. But right. What's really interesting is that, you know, when I was finishing up this Reimaginos project, you know, this my new record. It's amazing, by the way. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I you. I listened to the whole thing and I have notes and yeah, it's awesome. It's the easiest, <laughs> easiest uh, uh, record I've ever made. Wow! It was, it was it was easy and quick. I just went right through it, and uh, you know, and then you know, towards the end, I was like, "Oh, I need some better guitar playing." So I'd actually hired this Nashville guy, RJ Ronquillo, to play on it, and he was originally going to play on the whole thing, but then mm-hmm. he got kind of busy. You know, at first he was like, "Ah." Uh, you know, I'm, I got no work, you know, I'm really, you know, I'm like, oh, I can, I can hire him. So I hired him and he said, great. I have almost this whole month with nothing, no, no product demos. There's just nothing going on. And so uh, I hired him. I gave him some money or I promised I would give him some money. And then I wasn't, the songs were not quite ready to, I was, you know, I wanted, I had a, a drummer that was going to play on it and he played, actually played on the demos, but, uh, but then he got busy with his job because he, he uh, programs the robots for shop, right? Is it shop, right? <laughs> Stop and shop. I don't know. One of these. Stop gro- and shop. Marty, Marty's the robot. Marty's the robot. Yes. Yeah. 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 So Stop. he, he does programming <laughs> for individual stores for Marty. Wow. Good for him. And so all of a sudden, this was he was an essential worker. Yeah. So he, yeah. Couldn't, he could not play with me. And and even oh. now, it's like he's still super busy. And he's like, yeah, nah, I'm, I'm putting, I haven't played the drums in months. And, 
you know, I'm just trying to work out, you know, <laughs> and to keep my sanity. And yeah, we're all trying to keep our sanity in these days, man. It's tough. It is yeah. tough. Yeah. So, so back to the BOC days. Do you have any New Paltz stories? Any any BOC New Paltz stories back in the seventies? So, me and my wife met in New Paltz or Zappa stories. You got to have some Zappa uh, stories. We played at the <laughs> college there in New Paltz twice. Did you really? Where did you play? At the Elting uh, Elting Gym or in the Tripping Fields? No, it was in the gym twice. In, in the, the gym. gym. That's where Zappa played in seventy three. <laughs> and. Uh, and- <laughs> The second time we played, we were opening for um, uh, El, El, uh, Elvin Bishop. Elvin Bishop, nice. Just, huh. got Mickey. Uh, Formal blues player. As the uh, singer, you know, and so fooled around and fell in love was a big hit. So it was, yeah. a, it was a packed show. And so we were the opening act and. There might have even been another act on the show. I'm not sure. But we brought all our own equipment, including our lights. Wow. Back in that day, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it was uh, uh, my the Regal Tones, the band that I had with my brother, we made our own lights. So I just did the same thing for, you know, the soft right underbelly. So nice. we played. Nice. And while we were playing, there was a – a circle of people playing a drum circle and some guy playing sax and everybody was over there and they were ignoring us. Oh no. Yeah. And so after was it Ornette Coleman? If it's Ornette Coleman, that's okay. I don't know. Who it was. No, no, it was very, it was noisy and it, you know, yeah. everybody was, talking, so, you know, it was, it was not good, but so we were felt kind of bad, but our, our bass player who, I'm not even going to say who he was, but uh, he was so mad that oh. that by that response that he broke all our lights. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Come, like, on, Come, Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on. Our stuff. We didn't Put do anything. Together. Just off. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, you yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, I think we played. Oh, we played there. We played there again, I think. But that was not soft white underbelly. It was after that. Yeah, yeah. Right on, right on. Yeah. So, what are what are some of your best BOC memories? Like, uh, you know, tour memories, or like, are people you met, or like rocked? Like, some of what are some of the cool essence of those times, man? Because you rocked the world. Like, yeah, uh, shore to was, shore, coast to coast. Like, it was so many great uh, 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 moments. You know, uh, I love I loved touring with uh, uh, the Hunter Ronson band. That was fantastic. You know, we had a blast. And as a matter of fact, the original at Imaginos record had uh, a couple of guys in that band. Oh, cool. Just because we had uh, Tommy Morangello and uh, Tommy Mandel were were in uh, uh, in the Hunter Ronson band. And so uh, they ended up, you know, I, I, I uh, hired them to do Imaginos. And from them, I the other people, almost everybody else that played in Imaginos came through those two guys, except yeah. for uh, Kenny Aronson, who I knew, you know, way before that, you know, back mm-hmm. in the, you know, um, Derringer, I think he played with Rick Derringer. So, yeah. Awesome, man. Awesome. So, so the new album, Reimaginos, let's talk about it. You yeah. have all kinds of cool colored vinyl available. Um, yeah. I missed the cowbell. I was so pissed. I saw I missed the cowbell. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we got to talk about that. So let's, I, let's talk I about the. I didn't like them because uh, oh, I'm sure. it was so cheap. It was like <laughs> I, wa- I wanted them to put a stick <laughs> saying for display only. Right, right. So obviously this thing came out in 2000, right? It was 2000 when the whole cowbell Will Ferrell thing happened. Yes. And right. I'm, I'm a little younger than you. So that did, it did hit me. So. I got to tell you, I'm a big Fish fan. You know the band Fish, P-H-I-S-H? Sure, sure. Yeah, so yeah. I've seen them 141 times. Like, in Selma or whatever. I've yeah. seen them 141 times in concert. Oh, my God. I've lit- And I've seen 400 concerts. Like, I've literally. so. And I went to school at New Paltz in 93, no, uh, 93, 97, right yeah. when they were, like, really hitting. And they broke up in 2003. Right. And they did a thing in Vermont. And everyone was like, go to it. And they, and they take over the radio station when they do these things. And that so your skit that skit the cowbell skit came out in two thousand this is two thousand three four, yeah. and it hit that weekend 
it was the everything was about more cowbell and all of a sudden it hit the fish community like you wouldn't believe it everybody was like more cowbell like it just came out it was nuts it was all from coventry when fish broke up and it spread like nuts and cause, you, dude fish were breaking up everybody's there four days head full of whatever you had and everybody would see each other it was like more cowbell it was like this big like thing underlying theme of the whole festival yeah. it was really cool and um you know fish got back together since then and obviously mm-hmm. more cowbells mm-hmm. moved on but like just to let yeah. you know i was there and i felt that whole more cowbell movement from 2000 to when fish broke up and that whole <laughs> that weekend in vermont man everybody was about more cowbell and that is still reverberating in the fish community today. I can so, tell you. <laughs> so I have a story about the more cowbell thing, which cool. is, the, you know, when I when I uh, started this band with uh, Dennis Dunaway and my brother <sighs> Joe Blue Coop. Yes, uh, Dennis is like, we've got to write a song called More Cowbell, and I'm like, yeah, right, okay, right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's small kind of, tea, small tea, yeah, yeah. you know, and <laughs> and so this is a, several years after we'd started playing. And so he, so he went and wrote it himself. Right. That's funny. And uh, good for and, Dennis. Go Dennis. <laughs> and we recorded it. We put it out as a single and, you know, we got a little bit of traction, not really that much, but, uh, but, you know, when we played it in the States, people would really like it. It was a great crowd participation. Cause they go, uh, you know, what do you say? Uh, I got a fever. I got a fever. It's only one prescription. And, and, and then they go, it's more, more cowbell. <laughs> What's a prescription? More cowbell. What's yeah, a prescription? Man. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, we did this big <laughs> audience participation thing. So, we go we go to England and we play this song and it's like nothing. Oh. They never. Crickets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, us Americans, you know. It's it's <laughs> Uh, it's so much fun, though. So much fun. So let's talk about the new album, Reimaginos. When did you start thinking about making it? Uh, obviously, obviously, thirty I mean, years ago. But beyond that, like yeah. more recently, I, you know, I would get uh, uh, um, emails from fans. You know, I mean, because you know, my, you know, I have a uh, my my email address is out there. If you go on my website, you know, albertbouchard.net, you can get my email and you can write directly to me or you can find me on Facebook. Although past year, past few days. Yeah. Well, no, I actually went on Facebook to see how many crazy people would be like going on. You know, he's still great, you know. But, oh, they're out there. They're out there, brother. <laughs> It's quiet on Facebook. It's a pleasure yeah. Maybe to go back to Facebook. Who knows? <laughs> you know, but I wasn't going there for a while. But but you know, people write to me and say, uh, you know, when you know, when are you ever gonna get them to release your version of Imaginos, you know, the the demos. They call them the demos. That's a kind of a legal thing that they had to do, but yeah. they're not really the demos. And as a matter of fact, I actually put out a, a couple of the demos uh, myself on YouTube uh, over the past couple of weeks. And I'm Great. probably going to do another one tomorrow. So nice. uh, if I have a chance to, well, I actually know I'm not going to have a chance because. All right, I, coming soon, coming yeah. soon. Yeah, yeah, coming <laughs> soon will be the real demos. That's actually the rough mixes that I had shared with a, a big Blue Oyster Co. fan and, and said, uh, you know, it, there could be legal repercussions if you put this out there, you know, that, you know, and I don't want it coming back that I, I gave you. So they just, they try to get around it by saying they're the demos, you know, and for a while Columbia was taking it down, but now they, they don't care. They really don't care. It's like, fuck about you know, BOC is making them plenty of money and uh, it's all good. Good. You know? That's so, That's all. But, but, I would say, you know, I don't have the rights to it. I don't even know where the tapes are. I can't get my hands on them. And it, so we get uh, so many of these things you want to respond. So I would, and people would write back and say, well, have you ever thought of, you know, recording them over again? I do it again. Well, maybe, you know, maybe, yeah, but I'm, yeah. my plate is very full, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so and and but I really didn't think about it that much. But then uh, Sandy Perlman uh, had an accident where he fell down 
and uh, he might have had a little stroke or something, but uh, he fell down, hit his head, was in a coma for a month. And then I went to see him in the hospital after he came out of the coma. And he couldn't talk. You know, he could move a little bit. He could move. You know, he, he you know, he was conscious and, uh, you know, he responded to what I was saying. But he uh, so Sandy, you know, every time I've ever been with him, other than, you know, the two days that we were in the hospital, uh, I could barely get a word in edgewise. So now it's like me just talking to talk for eight hours. I would, I would talk constantly. I'd either talk or I'd, you know, I'd hold his hand for a while or, or, uh, or uh, sing, sing songs, all the songs that he liked, or even songs that, you know, the second day I'm starting to sing the Imagino songs and all of that stuff. And I, and I'm saying, you know, I really want to do this right. You know? And I said, uh, you you got to get better because there's a song that we started to write and it's not finished. And, you know, it's supposed to go on the next volume of Imaginos because I'm not only just going to redo Imaginos. I'm going to do all three records, just like we planned, you know, double vinyl, each one. So, uh, uh, then he died, you know, six months later he was dead. And, uh, and, uh, so, no, oh, oh, no, no, I can't talk. <laughs> That's my bass player. But anyway, so... Uh, we all need a bass player. <laughs> so I thought, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I, I kind of told him I was going to do this and then I didn't do it. And the same thing happened with my friend David Roeder. He, we were working on a record and he said, you know, if I don't make it, make sure the record comes out. You know, we really worked hard on this thing and I, I really want this record to come out. And of course that was 2003. And so it took me 15 years to finish the record. It was, it was rough, you know, cause I, you know, you don't expect people to die. And when they do, it's like, you don't even want to think about them, you know, yeah, especially, the reacts, yeah? you know, when you, Here's what I think, though, is that whenever I sing a song, and it doesn't matter if it's a, a, a Sandy Proman song or, you know, or, a, you know, it could be written by Bono. It could be anybody's song. Every time I sing that song, I feel that person. Yeah. I feel that person coming through me. I feel their voice coming through me. And so, uh, you know, I mean, this wasn't, you know, back back in the early days, it, it what didn't happen at all, but th- lately it happens all the time. I feel, you know, if I'm singing over there, I feel like I, I, I feel like Al Jolson, you know, mm-hmm. whatever mm-hmm. it was. Yeah, it was Al Jolson. Yeah, you know. So it's it's like you feel the 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 people that that push that record up, you know. So uh, so I couldn't do it right away. I was so upset about, you know, because Sandy and I were estranged when Imaginos came out. I was really in a bad place. I, I, I thought that Imaginos was going to be, you know, my. Your solo record. You know, my yeah. solo record and yeah. basically my the next phase of my career. Sure. And uh, then it got taken away from me or, or yeah, basically it got taken. I did the work and then right. everything got, it right. just. It shifted uh, to somebody else, the, like out of nowhere, right? Out of the loop. I was out of the loop. I had nothing to do with it. You know, the I just, you know, I got the test pressings for the vinyl like last week, right? And so, uh, you know, the first thing I did was uh, I, I, I played uh, one side and I said, well, wow, that sounds pretty good. And so then I put on a Steve Miller record, you know, Fly Like an Eagle. <laughs> You know that album because I had a I had a pristine copy. Actually, my girlfriend got a, a copy, uh, a box set of Steve Miller records, and nice. it had never been opened. Oh, so, it, so I just took this one, put it a, put it on, and I'm like, "Hey, my record sounds pretty good. It sounds kind of like that." Then I put on the original Imaginos, and I'm like, "Yes, this sounds way better than." <laughs> So, so yeah, yeah so that's yeah. so you know so a little i redemption, a little redemption I said, you know, 
you know, <laughs> test pressing sound great, you know, yeah, you know, full, full speed ahead. So anyway, I, I, that was out on Long Island. I, I had to buy a record player cause I don't have one. That's so funny. I got uh, one in the I last bought. year myself. I had sold my whole collection yeah. off like, like 15 years oh. ago, went digital. And since the pandemic, I started collecting and I'm full of vinyl and man, it's warm and fuzzy and awesome. <laughs> yeah, There's something well, different about vinyl. Something yeah, very like, different. You do that. <laughs> It's, going- it's great. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. So I'm the one you warned me of. Amazing song off the top. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, and, and girl that love made blind. It's funny. It's a hidden Christmas song, right? That's it's it's yeah. and it's yeah. another one that I, I just knocked me. astronomy. I listened to a few times over and over because yeah. it just it totally hit me. Yeah. The other- you know. Uh- I've been playing astronomy for many years and uh, with David Hirschberg and my solo group, we, we used to do it. So we recorded a track, you know, I, I was like, also feel, you know, I was feeling like the, the, uh, uh, the Imaginos version, the original Imaginos version was kind of fast. And for me, it was a little difficult to sing it. You know, I thought that Don did a much better job than I did because he basically he straightened out all the phrasing so that everything was on the beat. There was no syncopation right. whatsoever, which, you know, I don't like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Being a drummer, I like to sync. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, go figure. <laughs> but that was a song that sounded weird when you did that because it was so fast. So I wanted it slowed down. So we slowed it down to a more stately stately tempo and then uh and then i was thinking i don't know this just doesn't sound i need it to sound a little bit more different and so i one day i was going on a run i was like just thinking about you know i get obsessed with uh, you know how things should be you know and why does this not work i get vexed all the time you know i'm very I'm a little bit hard on myself, I think. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I was running and all of a sudden I was like, oh, wait a minute. I, now I remember what Sandy Perlman said when we were in the studio. He wanted to re-record it. And he wanted to do it. <clears throat> he wanted the intro. Forget about that whole. He said, that should come later. He said, I really want it to sound like the nuns from the convent up the up the hill there to come down and sing the first verse on the shore of the beach with just hand claps. That's the only background: hand claps and nuns. I'm like, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> so I came back from that run and I said, let me see if I can approximate how to do this. And I have this like. Uh, uh, harmony machine for uh, for for voice, and of course you can make higher harmonies. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You pitch shift, change, pitch shift it up. Yeah, change the genders. So yeah. I changed the females, and I, I'm saying I sang what I would normally. You know, I would sing. I actually sang the melody, and it created this great harmony around it. And I'm like, okay, so that's how that's how that wow. arranged. Wow, interesting. Yeah, that's so cool. That's yeah. so cool. And then when did you release it? Was it released in 18 or 19? Re- Reimaginos. When was the official release? It, the official release was November 6th. Oh, it was just released. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you're recording it in 1819 and it was yeah, released. I, recorded it, uh, I started in February and finished in May. Wow. Wow. So awesome, man. Basically, February through April. You know, it was done by the beginning of May, all the mixes and mastered right. and all of that. Right. Right. Well, then we had, uh, you know, we had the uh, artwork and all of that. That took a little bit of time. But mostly I was just waiting because uh, my brother Joe had a record already to go out. And so the record company wanted to push that. I, I didn't, you know, it was okay. I wasn't quite ready when uh, when his was. So I mm. waited until his, he had a, good run with his record and then blue oyster cult put out a record in october so he did his at the very end of august boc did it in the beginning of uh october so i figured i'll do mine in the beginning of november 
So I actually sat around for a while and, <laughs> you know, worked on some couple videos, you know, and tried to. Yeah, the videos are great. Oh, it's it's yeah. awesome. Everyone should go check it out and buy it. Um, it's yeah. it's I gotta get my. I'm mad that the cowbell sold out, even though you say it's cheesy. I still wish I could have it for Dooner's World because it's so awesome. Um, well, if you ever Blue Coop sells them because we still do that. Oh. Oh, the blue coop, of course, with Dennis, right, right. Yeah. So we still do more cowbell. And we have blue coop. We have blue coop cowbells. There you go. There you go. All right. Blue awesome. Coop. So, uh, you know, you could get one of those. Those, those you can actually play. They don't sound good, but they're not going to dent right away. <laughs> so I miss. I got. I got to admit, you guys played in Danbury about a year and a half or two years ago, and I missed it, and I was so pissed. I was like. There was some, it was a big anniversary thing. There's something going on in Danbury, and I missed it. because It was a, a benefit, I think. Yes, yeah, so it was a benefit. You're right. You're right. And I slept on it, and I'm so pissed, cool man. Show. Yeah. I'm so pissed. Next time you come around, I'm going to be there. I'm a huge BOC fan, huge Alice Cooper fan, and now I'm a huge Albert Bouchard fan because I've been listening to Reed Maginos, and everybody should. My top five are I'm the one you warned me of, Girl the Girl Love Maybe Blind, Astronomy, Imaginos, and Boy, It's Your Cult. Those are my top five from the album. Um, okay. Everybody should go check it out. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So what's yeah. next? What's next, man? Well, uh, I'm today. It's crazy. It's been a crazy day. I I got up. I I, I got up early because I I couldn't sleep. I was uh, same here. That's my days for me. <laughs> well, I usually I've been sleeping well, but uh, I had started um, uh, working on the follow up. You know the follow up to Reimagine Those. Good, which, good, uh, good to hear. And I have all the songs. At first, I didn't know. You know, I had songs that we, a couple songs that I'd written with Sandy, and I had this other song that was unfinished that I oh. sent to him in the hospital. Oh. You know, and I'm like, you gotta, you gotta get better so that I can, you can help me finish this song. So this morning, I got up and I started working on it. You know, I started like taking Away. different wow. things that Sandy had written and kind of like, how can I make this work? And it's the song is called Independence Day. And the cook is we're awesome. going to we're going to have a land of our own. Well, the whole thing about the the next uh, the, the story is it starts at the very beginning of World War One. And it goes all the way to World War Three which <laughs> hasn't happened yet. We're somewhere but, in between, aren't we? <laughs> we, we can think about it. We're yeah. somewhere in between those two. It's not that hard to imagine. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, so World War Three. so, uh, so it's, uh, it's unlike Imagino, so it's just kind of more gentle and, and this is going to be a, a more aggressive record. You know, uh, oh. ME-262 is supposed to be the, the middle, middle part of it. So, you know. Awesome, yeah. man. Well, dude, I can't wait for it. Thanks a lot for coming on and talking to me, Albert. It's sure. been a lot of fun, man. So I want you to come. This is the end of season. Well, almost the end. I have two more episodes of season one. I've done like 157. And I'm going to start season two live streaming Thursdays and Saturdays, 8 to 10 p.m. Um, so come on my show next year, man. Or I already think it's, you know. We're in 2021. Year. I feel like we're in the same year, right? I'll, hopefully, yeah, yeah. It'll feel, hopefully it'll feel different soon. Oh, how's that? In a few days. In a few days, it'll feel a little different. But yeah. thanks, brother. I really appreciate you coming on, man. You're welcome. Peace, love, and Frank Zappa.